Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Day Trading with Weekly Options. Today's presenter is Senior Market Strategist, Broker, and Author, Carly Gardner. Welcome, Carly. Thanks, Tom. It's good to be here. It's our pleasure. My name is Tom Hartle. I am CQG's Director of Product Training. I will be your host and moderator today. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section window at any time. We'll have Carly answer the questions at the end of this presentation. If you are viewing the presentation in full screen mode, you can find the Q&A in the WebEx toolbar at the top of your screen in the drop-down menu on the far right. If you're having any sound issues, please contact the host via WebEx chat. We'll be recording today's webinar, and it will be posted within 48 hours to the events section on news.cqg.com. All registered attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Carly Garner. Ms. Garner is a magna cum laude graduate of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Her career began in 2004. Today she is a commodities broker with DeCarly Trading, a division of Zener in Las Vegas, Nevada. She is also author of Higher Probability Commodity Trading and three other titles. Carly writes a monthly column for Stocks and Commodities Magazine and is a contributor to TheStreet.com and The Real Money Pro Service. Her commodity market analysis is often referenced on Jim Cramer's Mad Money on CNBC. And now, Carly, it's my pleasure to turn the webinar over to you. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, we're excited to be here. We appreciate the opportunity that CQG has given us. And uh, we hope that everybody that's in attendance today will walk away with uh, something extra, something that will help their trading, whether they're day trading or position trading or, um, you know, what, regardless of their strategy and time frame, hopefully we can, we can help you out a little. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I am a commodity broker. I work at DeCarly Trading in Las Vegas, Nevada. And, yes, it, uh, it's a little ironic that we're commodity brokerage in Las Vegas. They're um, probably not a coincidence. You know, commodity trading is pretty speculative, and I guess so is – uh, walking into a casino. So anyway, um, if you have any questions or comments at any point uh, after the class, you can give me a call or you can send me an email. Here's my contact information. If you're on social media, check us out. Uh, Twitter, my handle is at Carly Garner. We're also on Facebook. You can just do a search for DeCarly Trading or even Carly Garner and we should come up. And uh, if you're on Instagram, we're there. Okay, uh, obviously, today we're going to talk about day trading with weekly options, and uh, we're going to talk about the long and the short of it, because if, if you've ever been to any of our classes before, or, um, you know, you've, you've read any, any of my other books or anything like that, you, you absolutely probably know that we tend to promote option trading, um, just because it gives traders a little better odds of success, at least in my opinion. There's more room for error is really the big factor that I want you all to walk away from this class with. Um, but it's not it's not easy. It's a little more complicated. You know, people like to trade futures because it's very simple. They know exactly what they're going to make or lose if they buy here and sell there. Options are a little different, but hopefully we can shorten the learning curve for you. Uh, and another thing I wanted to mention is today is or actually this class in particular is a, a little bit of a celebration. We're celebrating the release of my newest book, Higher, Commodity, Higher Probability Commodity Trading. It can be found in any major book outlet. Obviously, Amazon's usually the most convenient and cheapest place for most people to, to access it. You can check out our website if you want to know a little more at higherprobabilitycommoditytradingbook.com. And we're super excited. Um, I mean, this has kind of been – I've been in the business for – for 12 years, and this has just kind of been the accumulation of all the little things that I've learned the hard way, and, uh, you know, even through my talks with uh, other traders in the business and other industry insiders, so I hope that uh, if you are interested in anything we talk about today and learning a little more, that you check out the book. And obviously, there's a substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. We're not buying CDs here. There's no guaranteed return. This is pure speculation. It's not suitable for everybody.
before we really get into into the nuts and bolts of everything, I just wanted to kind of point something out. Um, there's really three ways for day traders to speculate. I would venture to say that 99.9% .9 of retail traders assume that the only way to day trade is with a futures contract. If you're, if you're bullish, you go long. If you're bearish, you go short. And, and that's that. Um, but there's actually two other ways that day traders can capitalize on price changes, or hopefully attempt to capitalize, I should say, um, with potentially, in my opinion, a little better odds of success because it gives them more lasting power. And we're going to talk about why that is as we go on throughout the rest of the slides. Um, but just keep in mind, there's three ways to speculate. So with a futures contract, or you can buy or sell a futures contract in addition to the purchase of insurance. And today we're going to focus on weekly options because they tend to be cheapest. The thing is, when you're buying insurance, and you, you know we all know this, when you're, it's the same as buying car insurance or home insurance, you're, you're trying to get the best deal, right? You don't want to overpay for it. Well, when you're buying options as protection against futures, if you're paying a lot of money for time you don't need or you're doing it in a volatile period, you're probably paying too much for your insurance and it's, it's going to mess up the whole trade. Um, it increases your risk and it decreases your profit potential and it also decreases the odds of success. So the weekly options have really gone a long way in, in uh, benefiting traders in that it makes it a little easier for this particular strategy to, to take place. And we're going to go into more detail. I'm just kind of uh, throwing this out there for now so you don't have to fully understand it. Don't worry. If, don't panic if you're, if you're not following me. Uh, the third way to speculate is real simple. You can either buy a call or buy a put. And if you're using the weekly options, you can buy an option that expires in two or three days. They're really, really cheap. Now, there's some drawbacks to that, and we're going to talk about them. But the point is, it's a very low risk and limited risk way to get involved in the markets, and it gives you lasting power. And here's why. Don't be afraid to be different. Most traders migrate to what's comfortable. I mean, we're human. That's what we do. When it comes to day traders, they tend to stick to futures trading. And then they place stop loss orders for risk management. This is just, this is the way most books tell you to do it. This is the way everyone's always done it. And again, it's convenient because it's easy and simple and to understand. And so that's what most people tend to do. However, maybe we should start asking ourselves if it's comfortable and common, maybe it's not always the most efficient or effective way to do it. So again, day traders generally assume that the best method of risk management is through stop loss orders, but is this really true? I have some serious doubts. Anybody that's ever been stopped out of a trade just before the market turns in the desired direction might have a differing opinion. I mean, think about it. Stops are there to protect us, right? They're supposed to stop us from runaway uh, big losses and runaway markets, and that's great. But it's Murphy's Law. Traders are frequently stopped out at a market high or a market low, it causes the maximum pain. And these premature stopouts are not only really expensive and account draining, but they trigger counterproductive emotions and it leads to poor decision making. Of course, stops aren't all bad, so I would just want to point out the obvious, and this is why most people use stop loss orders. It's because it, you know, we, I just mentioned before, but I'll say it again, it reduces the risk of a runaway trade. You can feel free to get up in the middle of the trading day, go get a cup of joe, and without coming back to something completely devastating. You know, if, if uh, some piece of unexpected news really moves the market while you're filling up your coffee, your stop's there to protect you, just in case. And there's comfort in knowing that there's absolute risk. You know if you place a stop five handles deep in the E-mini S&P, you're risking 250 bucks, And it feels good to know what your total risk is. Now, of course, this doesn't include slippage. We all know with stop orders, there's potential slippage. In a market like the E-mini S&P, which is kind of what we're going to focus on today just because it's a popular day trading market, um, slippage is usually pretty minimal. But it, is, it can happen, and sometimes it can be big. Um, Particularly if, if you've noticed in earnings season, you know, you'll see the market uh, between the 115 pause 
and then reopening at 1.30, I should say, you guys probably aren't in the Pacific time zone like I am. So if you're in Central time zone, it's going to be 3.15 pause, and it reopens at uh, 3.30. Sometimes there's earnings announcements in that time frame, and the market jumps. And so it could very easily jump your stop. And so maybe your $250 risk ends up being 400 or, you know. But generally speaking, stop orders do a pretty good job of limiting the risk of traders. And the other great thing about stop orders is, they mitigate the emotional duress caused by the decision on when to pull the plug on a bad trade. When a trade starts going against you, it's really hard to say, okay, enough's enough, I'm getting out, because in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, well, if I get out, I'm walking at a loss. If I stay in, it's possible that the market recovers and I get my money back. And every trader, I mean, if they if they tell you they don't think like that, they're lying. Is it... Is that a productive way to think? Probably not, but we're human, that's how we think. So we're gonna talk about uh, a little later when we use options, the idea is you're gonna get all those benefits of stop loss orders, but you also get the advantage of never having to worry about being prematurely stopped out before the market moves your way. So the main disadvantages of stop orders are really the finite nature of trade exit, once a trade is stopped out, it's impossible to recover, even if the market does, and it often does. Like I mentioned before, people are constantly being stopped out on the highs or the lows of the day. They're losing money when, in reality, if they could have just hung on a little longer or let the trade go against them a little further, they would have been just fine. Not only would they have recovered their losses, but they probably would have come out profitable. So it's really frustrating to be right on a particular position and still lose money, but it happens all the time. And the problem is, if, you, if, you, if you're protecting yourself with a stop order and you do get stopped out prematurely, you can't do anything from the sidelines. Once you're out, you're out. Now, some of you are thinking, well, you just get back in and place a new stop, and that's true. You can do that. But it's usually a pretty destructive behavior. Uh, getting back into the market after being stopped out is generally a bad idea. You're chasing prices higher, so not only are you leaving money on the table from where you st were stopped out to where you're now getting in, because generally speaking, the market tends to bounce back, and all of a sudden you're chasing prices. Uh, you locked in a little loss on your stop out and re-entry, and at this point you're probably emotional, and vengeance trading rarely works favorably. Obviously, most books you read and most uh, classes you attend, people are going to say always, always, always use stops. And again, the idea is you don't want to be caught in the flash crash or something abnormal that happens infrequently, but it does happen and leaves you sitting on massive losses in a matter, sometimes in a matter of minutes. But with all of that in mind, Years of watching the markets has led me to the conclusion that stops are probably more detrimental to traders in the long run than they are beneficial. And again, this is an opinion. Other people think complete opposite, so you just have to, um, you know, test out the theory and, and see how it works for you and, and come to what you're comfortable with. But I strongly believe that stop orders can, can do a lot of harm, especially for traders that um, – a lot of beginning traders, they tend to want to have small risks. They want to place a one-handle stop in the S&P or a two-handle stop. And then, you know, the idea is if, if they're right, they can make money. If they're wrong, they lose 50 to 100 bucks. But guess what? The odds of you picking a higher low in a market, or even if you're going with a trend, the, the idea of you buying into a, an uptrend and it not ebbing and flowing a point or two before going in your favor is not that great you're probably going to get stopped out 80 or 90% of the time. So even though you're losing money only 50 to 100 bucks on a trade, if you lose on 10 trades, suddenly we're talking real money. If you lose on 20, you know what I mean? It adds up really fast. There are some ways to go around the whole idea of placing stop losses. If you still want protection, but you don't want the idea of premature stop outs, and you don't want to have to... Uh, worry about the flash crash occurring while you go to the bathroom, you can do a couple of things. The first one, which is completely not even part of this class, but I had to throw it in there just because I didn't want to be incomplete. But who says you have to trade the E-mini S&P or the full-size gold or full-size corn? You can trade the E-minis. You can trade uh, 
e-micro gold. You can trade e-micro currencies. And guess what? They you can make or lose money, but you can't make or lose all that much. So you can relatively comfortably position trade some of these really small contracts, and there's no need for a stop. So if something really crazy does happen and you're caught on the wrong side, yes, you're going to lose money, but it's not going to be an account draining amount of money. It's going to be something that you can probably bounce back at from, and you may even want to add to your position when it happens. So that's on a side note. But for today's topic, uh, the ways to get around stop loss orders are buying weekly options to protect your futures position. So instead of placing a stop that's $250 deep or five points deep in the E-mini S&P, you just simply buy an option for five bucks and make that your risk. Now your risk may be a little higher depending on which option, and we're going to kind of go through that in a minute. But generally speaking in the S&P, you can, using the weekly options, you can trade at the money options for 500 bucks or less. Um, which is not a bad deal, especially when you're talking about buying insurance on your day trades. And the other thing is you don't have to trade futures at all. You know, um, you can simply bypass futures and just buy or, you know, buy weekly calls or puts. If you think the market's going to go up today, you buy a call. If you think it's going down, you buy a put. So that's another way to do it. Um, so again, before we get into the, the option side of things, I just want to reiterate, the problem with an involuntary liquidation at the hands of a stop order is the impossibility of recovery. Once a trader's on the sidelines, it's impossible to mend a trading account from a poorly timed exit. And trust me, with stop orders, it happens a lot. So as we're going to talk about, with options, you're not going to have that problem. The S&P could go to zero and you're you're going to be losing money, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say, like, if you're if you're bullish the S&P and you go along a futures contract and then you buy a put option for insurance and the S&P drops, you are going to lose money. But you're only going to lose whatever you paid for your insurance, plus or minus any distance between the strike price and your futures entry price. So your risk is limited. But the beauty of it is you have the ability to recover, whereas someone that gets stopped out and with a big loss – they're on the sidelines and they're crying and they're wondering how are they so unlucky to get stopped out on the low of the day. An option trader could watch the S&P go all the, way, all the way down to zero and he knows if the market bounces back, he's still on the trade. It couldn't get any worse, but it could get better. So the bottom line is using options instead of stops provide lasting power. And we're going to show you an example in a minute on a chart of just how um, futures traders really tend to puke out their long positions on the low and they're squeezed out of their shorts on the high. It, it just happens. It's, the markets are mean. I don't know how else to explain it. They're mean. They'll force you out at the worst time and the worst price, only to turn around and go the way you thought it was going to go. Imagine, if you will, being stopped out on Thursday night before the Brexit vote. I'm sure a lot of you were following on the days before the Brexit vote. The polls were showing that uh, Great Britain was going to stay in the euro and everything was going to be fine. And then as a result, the S&P rallied about 40 handles in the day and a half leading up to the actual vote. I mean, it was a really sharp rally. I can only imagine how many people got stopped out on the highs. Um, I mean, you can see the pain in the in the price here. I don't know if you remember, but there was basically a lot of resistance around like 2103, 2104, and then again around 2109, which was the previous swing high. So I can venture to guess that there were a lot of stop loss orders here. I would bet. That's what we saw with this little rally from 2110 up to 2120 that took place, by the way, overnight. People were probably eating dinner, uh, relaxing, watching TV, not knowing that their stop order was getting run. And they probably had, had still have nightmares about this. But imagine being stopped out at 2120, the peak, um, just before we get something like this. This is a 120-point drop. For those of you that are familiar with the S&P, uh, that's, I mean, the equivalent of $6,000, roughly. We're just rounding. But imagine someone 
I would say if someone took a cell signal up here, you could see how maybe a system might have trig triggered some sort of cell system. Um, or maybe they thought this little range right here, 2190, would, was, was a good place to sell. Regardless, it was very conceivable that someone might have lost 1,000, 1,500 to 2,000 getting stopped out up here and then missing out on the $6,000 drop off immediately after. An option trader uh, would have been losing money on this, like a bearish option trader might have bought a put or they might have sold a future and then purchased their call option up here. At this point, he would have said, he would have been thinking, darn, I was wrong and I'm out six, seven, eight hundred bucks, whatever the tra particular trade was. But he knows that his max ri risk is achieved and he knows if he holds the expiration, which if you're talking weekly options, which, is, which are what we're talking about today, um, if he holds to the end of the week, it could be better. It couldn't have gotten worse. At this point, the option trader is saying, well, it can't get any worse, it can only get better. And guess what? It did. The futures traders, it was probably watching the market fall in horror, scared to chase it all the way down. And so this being right about the price of vote, that trader would have lost a lot of money. And um, could have very easily ruined his, you know, his trading career. Because not only, I mean, I'm not saying a $2,000 loss is going to ruin somebody's life, or it might, but most traders it wouldn't. But what might ruin their life is the frustration and the angst that they get from that experience. And if it dictates their future, you know, their future actions, it really could cause some problems. Okay, so the weekly ES options, and ES is the E-mini S&P, for those of you that aren't familiar with the symbols, they are an excellent day trading tool. Okay, so this is uh, one of my favorite quotes by Steve Cohen, who's a hedge fund manager. If you're going to be, well, basically he's saying you're going to be wrong a lot. He's not saying if you're going to be wrong. He is saying you are going to be wrong a lot. And if that's the case, you better make sure your losses are as small as they can be and your winners are bigger. So with that in mind, as a day trader, I think it's a good idea to look at the weekly S&P options. Now, a couple of years ago, um, weekly S&P options, well, actually, I can't remember exactly when they rolled them out. It's probably been three years, but I'm just taking a stab at it. Um, the situation is, if, uh, sorry about that. I was distracted for a second. So the weekly S&P options have been around for a little while, but when they first started, they were on the thin side. Well, things have changed. You may have noticed, like, um, let's just go roll back about four, five, six years ago. You probably remember we really only had quarterly, or I'm sorry, monthly options. So the third Friday of every month, options expired. And the markets moved on that. You used to see, uh, basically, the markets would kind of rally on the, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of option expiration, and then the last couple of days was kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes it would squeeze higher, sometimes it would sell off. But there were some definite patterns going into the third Friday of every month because of option expiration. You don't really see that anymore because times have changed. With the weekly options, we have options that expire each and every Friday of every month. So you no longer have these big you know, speculative price moves going into option expiration, because guess what, expiration is no big deal anymore. It happens every week. Uh, one thing to keep in mind also is the CME has recently changed the way that they have, they quote uh, or use symbols for their options. They used to have uh, January options, February options, March options, well, now they have basically, for January and February, they don't have monthly options. They only have weeklies. And then for the um, 
traditional March, like the quarterly options, they do actually have monthly options. So it's very confusing. Um, I'm not going to quit quiz you on that at the end of the class, but just keep in mind, so if you're pulling up on your quote board and you get confused because you're only seeing weeklies on some months and then some months you actually see a monthly, it's re it really is just because uh, the CME changed symbols on us. It's, it's nothing more than that. So just remember the quarterlies do have monthly options, but the serial months, which are anything other than March, uh, June, September, December, are um, – are weeklies. So anyway, with that said, the idea is uh, the CME weekly options offer a cheap and e efficient and effective way for day traders to hedge the risk or to even partake in risk. Now before we talk about the advantages of the options, I want to just revisit the idea of selling, just simply selling a future if you're bearish. So if you're bearish a market, remember the choices are you can sell a future, you can buy a weekly put, or you can sell a future and buy a call option for insurance. So before we talk about the alternative strategies that some of you might not be aware of, let's just kind of reiterate why people are drawn to futures. Well, the advantages of trading futures outright is it offers traders a very efficient and quick way to gain exposure to price changes. It is pure. If you sell it at the market and the market drops a handle in the S&P, you make 50 bucks. It's super simple. It's easy. Um, profit and loss calculations are easy. You know exactly what's going on. You get immediate results. You have theoretically unlimited profit potential. It's highly leveraged and it's, it's very pure. On the flip side, although all those things sound great, the problem with that is there's really no room for error. You have to be really precise in your entry. And again, the detriment of, play, of trading futures is you have to protect yourself with a stop order, unless you do it with an option, but if you did it with a stop, then if, if you don't give yourself enough room for error, you're doomed. You're stopped out at an inopportune time and it's hard to get your money back. So a lot, you have to keep in mind, a lot of these times um, when traders do get stopped out, it's not like the market, you know, let's say a trader's long the E-mini S&P, it's not like the market dribbles down slowly and hits their stop and then continues dribbling down. That's really not how it normally works. A lot of times people place their stop orders around the same general areas. It might be right below the previous swing low, um, right below, you know, who knows, a Bollinger Band, whatever it is that they're they're using. Most traders are using the same general instruments. So what happens is all the stops get in the same place. So when a stop, when stops are hit, it's not a slow, gradual process. It's boom, boom, and then the market generally recovers pretty quickly. So you can see the S&P drop four or five handles real quickly in a couple of minutes, running stops. And then as all the stop orders are filled, the selling dries up and the market rebounds as if it never happened. And so anyone that was stopped out on that little blip is just out of luck. They're out of the market on the sideline with a loss and the futures market has bounced back right where it started. So let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of buying a put option outright. So if you're bearish a market, and again, this is for day traders, not necessarily position traders, but that doesn't mean you have to be in and out in a session. Day traders really shouldn't confine themselves to that uh, that tight of a, a definition because guess what? The markets aren't on timers. They don't care if you have to be out by the close or you want to be flat by the time you're eating dinner. The market's going to do what it's going to do. If you really want to give your system the, a chance to, to trade the way that it's supposed to, you have to take if a signal occurs – you know, an hour before the close and it doesn't play out, you might want to hold that overnight, at least into the early hours of the after session to let your signal play out. So um, when I say day trading, I'm talking about quick trading, maybe a day, maybe it's a few hours, maybe it's 24 hours, maybe it's two days, but I'm talking about a quick signal. But uh, anyway, just thought I'd clarify that. But the advantages and disadvantages of buying a put option. So Buying a put option outright, and I'm talking about weekly put options, is it's really the lowest risk option to simply, it's simply just purchasing a put outright. Uh, and the reason it's 
the lowest risk is it's generally the cheapest, although it depends on market conditions, and we're going to show you a quote board so we can point that out uh, soon. If the market is in a downswing, it's not the cheapest, but it is the simplest. There's no margin. There's no stress. You buy an option for X number of dollars. Like I said, you can usually get pretty close to the money with 500 bucks or less, and you know exactly what your risk is. You know what's going to, you know, if the market drops, you know what you're in for. The flip side of just buying a put outright or a weekly put is there's no immediate gratification where the futures trader, he sells and he's immediately making or losing money and it's exciting. An option trader isn't, is going to see a lot less volatility on his trade. The ES is going to have to travel significantly before profits show up. Um, and significantly in regards to day trade, I'm may, we're maybe only talking four or five handles before you know seeing a profit. But remember, a futures trader will see his profits show up if the market moves a handle in his favor. So the option trading is a lot slower. Um, it's not going to be nearly as exciting. And you do have to keep in mind that there is a bid-ask spread and some potential slippage in getting in and out of the options. Now, when you're trading the E-mini S&P future, it's extremely liquid. You buy or sell at the market, and you're talking a quarter tick spread, and it's really kind of un un or inconsequential, I should say. The bid ask on the options are usually about a half a dollar. Um, so in, in real money, that's like 25 bucks. So you don't want to be in and out. Like a, a futures contract, you could be in and out, in and out, in and out all day long, in and out minute by minute. Options, you don't want to do that. You're just going to chop yourself to death. You can't do that because there is a bid ask spread. There is a little extra cost in transacting. But if your plan is to hang on for a couple of hours, you know, or a couple, if you think the S&P is going to move five to ten points, it could be worth it. Okay, so the alternative strategy is, uh, again, if you're bearish, you can sell a futures contract and then buy a call option above it. And we're going to look at a more detailed example, but I'm just trying to give you the overall. Uh, the idea of this is it's actually called a synthetic put because it mimics buying a put option. It's really similar to just buying an outright put option. In fact, it's almost the same thing. The benefit of it, as opposed to just buying the put, is you have two legs of the trade, so you can adjust it a little easier. It's not an all-in or all-out strategy. If you sell a future and you buy a call and the market goes up, at some point you might say, hey, I'm making money on my call option. I'm going to sell that, take the profit, and then I'll hold the short future and hope that things get better. So there's always room for adjustments if you're doing a synthetic. And also, a synthetic has the ability to give you a little more bang for your buck because the futures price can move quicker than, than the option generally will. Uh, you have theoretically unlimited profit potential. You would have limited risk. When you buy that call option to protect your short futures, the most you could ever lose is what you pay for the call option plus or minus any difference between the strike price and the futures entry price. So you're absolutely covered. And you can recycle your insurance. That's the great thing. Let's say that you sell a futures contract and you buy a call and the market goes in your favor and you say, hey, I'm picking up a little money on my futures contract. I think I'm going to offset that. You can always hold your call. You don't have to sell it. You, of course, if you do hold it, you know, that's money that's slowly eroding away, and we'll talk about that in a second. Options do erode, so that's a, a drawback of it. But you can still hold that call, and if the market pops back up, you can resell the futures contract and kind of recycle your insurance policy. Like, you, you know, you're using it for the next trade also. So you don't have to always get out of your options just because you're out of your future. If you think the market might bounce back and give you another chance to reestablish, go for it. Now, again, um, you know, it takes a little bit of skill. This is, I'm making it sound extremely easy. It's obviously not that easy, but uh, that's day trading. You know, speculating and guessing where the market's going to be in 10 minutes to an hour is ne not necessarily an easy task. The downside of doing it this way, selling a future and buying a call, is you have to overcome the premium that you're paying before you make any money. So if you spend $5 in premium, to buy your call option, the S&P has to drop $5 for you to even get back to scratch at expiration. So the market's got to move enough for you to recoup what you paid. And 
one thing that I need to tell you about options is, if you're not aware of this, options are an eroding asset. When you buy an option, all else being equal, if pr the pr market doesn't move and time goes by, the option erodes. And weekly options erode really fast. So if you put your trade on, and the, your, let's say your futures contract is breaking even, the S&P hasn't moved, but two days have gone by, your option is going to be losing money. So you will have lost money even though you weren't necessarily wrong. So that's something to be aware of. And at the money options, only have a delta of 50. And I'm going to show you an example of this in a minute. But the idea is the delta will represent how quickly that or how responsive that option is to futures price movement. Okay, let's take a look at some examples. Okay, so again, we're looking at an E-mini S&P chart. This is an intraday chart, and you'll notice it's not too long after the Brexit ordeal. This is the Brexit high, and this is the Brexit low. Uh, but let's assume that we're a day trader here, and we think the market's a little overbought, and maybe we want to play the downside. But with that in mind, we know that volatility is high, and short squeezes, you just never know where they're going to end up. So here's our decision. We can either sell a futures contract, we could buy a put, or we could sell a futures and then buy a call as insurance. All right, before we do that, I just want to show you something real quick um, in regards to delta. Now, I told you delta is basically the rate of change of an option versus its underlying futures contract. The higher the delta, the higher the risk. So what you're going to need to know is the delta of a futures contract is one. And this is because for every point that the futures market moves, you're making or losing a point. Your profit and loss is one point. That's that's obvious and that's easy. So flip over to options and it becomes a little more complicated. An at the money option, you'll notice uh, in this example, this is actually just by the way, the, uh, the trading example we're going to look at in the next slide is going to be a little different, a little different pricing than this. I just wanted to show you what delta was. Uh, but it, let's assume that the market's at 2084. And so we go to the 2085 options. And this is a cool, uh, by the way, this is CQG's Q Trader, which is kind of their middle of the road platform. And I think it's, I think it's pretty awesome because it's, it's a great way for retail traders who don't want to uh, spend a lot of money in the, in the big, over-the-top, you know, fancy applications. They can get in with this uh, kind of an option starter kit for, um, for a pretty reasonable sum of money. And you get the market delta, uh, the Greeks, all those sorts of things. So it's actually a pretty nice setup. And I think, uh, you know, I know a lot of our clients will probably be interested in it. So um, just keep it in mind, it's CQG Q Trader. So anyway, looking back to the, uh, this is a, a quote board in Q Trader, and I uh, set it up to show deltas. And you'll notice this right here is the delta, these red circles. This is the strike price of 2085, which is at the money. And I think off the top of my head, this is a was a weekly, I think it had two days to expiration to give you an idea, and it's going for $7 in premium, which is 350 bucks. So you can see how there's a little money to be made here, possibly if your timing is right, because you're only spending 750 bucks for a two-day speculation in the E-mini S&P. The S&P only has to move your favor seven points for you to make money. Now, again, it sounds easier than it is because all, there's all kinds of other factors going on. Um, and if the market, we've seen, you know, recently the S&P trading range is only about 10 handles. It's not going anywhere. So in an environment like that, your $7 or 350 bucks would just go up in pixie dust. So it's not by any means easy money, but it is a good way to get involved in the markets with low risk. 
The point of this slide, though, is we're showing you that an at-the-money option has a delta of about 50. And what that means is if the S&P goes up 10 points, this option will make or lose five points. So the put options would lose five points. The call options would make five points. Okay, and this slide is also um, not necessarily the trading example we're specifically looking at, but I wanted to point this out also, so it'll help, help you understand the next couple of slides. Um, this is a, an option board of the week threes. Um, and I had mentioned before that the serial options, remember the any month other than uh, the quarterlies, the week three options have been, have replaced the monthly options. So this is basically the equivalent of a monthly option. Uh, if, you, if we would have been talking about this option a few months ago, we would have just called it the, the July, op <laughs> would have been the July call, but instead now it's the July week threes. So with that said, it has seven days to expiration, 17 days, I should say, sorry, 17 days to expiration. And you'll see how much more expensive they are. Remember, we were just looking at an option that was $7 in premium or $350. Bucks. Well, this option, because it has a lot more time, is running $1,300 for the call. And we're talking eleven dollars to $1,200 for the put. So you can see why the weekly options pose such a, a big advantage over the, the monthly options, which have a little more time to expiration, because you're paying for time. And as a day trader or a short-term trader, you really don't want to risk $1,300 on a trade. Now, I, I understand that you're not going to hold the expiration, and so you're probably going to be able, if you're only holding for a couple of days, you're probably going to be able to sell that for a lot more than zero. However, you still have that risk of if there's a flash crash or something ridiculous happens, that premium can just go up and smoke really fast. So it's just a little less reasonable to, to work with the monthly options. I'm not saying it's a horrible idea, but uh, let's go to our weekly options example, and I think you'll see where the benefit comes in. Okay, so this is uh, a weekly option with three days to expiration. It's a week one, to be exact. Not that it matters. Uh, but this is a week one op option. It's at the money. The futures price, as we can see on our CQG uh, QTrader, quote board is 256. So the strike price is, uh, I, sorry, 2056. So the strike price is 2055. So it's relatively at the money. It's about a dollar and a quarter in the money. Um, so what this means is a trader could buy a 2055 call and sell a futures contract and have a total risk and three days in the market for 11 points or 550 bucks. Now you might be saying, but wait a minute, that option is 1225, why am I saying that the risk is only 11? Well, remember how before I said your risk is going to be what you pay for your protection, your long option insurance, plus or minus any uh, difference between the strike price and the futures price. Well, in this case, the strike price is 2055 and the futures price is 2056. So you're automatically basically locking in a dollar and a quarter between those two because of the difference in the futures price and the strike price, and that dollar and a quarter you can never lose. You, you get to keep it no matter what. Um, however, if, this, you know, if the trade expires worthless, if the market's uh, above 2055, then you're out this 550 bucks, which again, for three days, is not too bad. The alternative is you could buy a 2055 put, for ten and a half, your total risk is uh, five hundred and twenty five bucks. Now again, the futures price has to move enough in your favor to overcome that loss. That's the the big disadvantage of this kind of strategy. If you were just going to sell the future at twenty fifty fifty six and place a ten handle stop, your risk would be the same. It would be ten points or five hundred bucks. So the dollar risk would be the same. But if your timing was perfect and the market dropped, you would be making money immediately on your short futures, whereas 
if you did it with the long put or the synthetic strategy of buying a call and selling a future, the market has to drop about 10 points just for you to get your money back on your insurance. So the opportunity cost of avoiding premature stop outs and giving yourself lasting power is you have to be a little more right if you're right. So you're timing, you're giving yourself more room for error on timing in exchange for being a little more right in the direction, if that makes sense. Okay, so a trader going short a future at 2056 and buying a 2055 call for 12 bucks faces absolute risk of $550 for three days in the market. So this is what uh, the payoff diagram might look like. You'll see that the trader breaks even around 2044 because he has to make up that uh, 12 handles that he bought, that he paid for his insurance. So again, that's the opportunity cost. But the, the nice side is, no matter how wrong he gets, let's say if the S&P goes up to 20, 2120 or 2140, he knows that it can't get any worse up there, but it could get better. So although he's going to be losing his $550 at any point on this price point range, he knows the market could reverse, whereas a futures trader wouldn't have that luxury. A futures trader would get stopped out, hopefully somewhere down here and not up here, but at some point he'd probably get stopped out and then just be left holding the bag when the market reverses, if it ever does. So you have the same obstacle if you're simply buying a put. Um, and this this trader could have potentially bought a 2050 put for five dollars or 250 bucks. This is a cheaper way to to play it. Your risk is only 250 bucks, and and the difference here is we're not buying an at the money put. We're buying an out of the money put. So the market has your break even is about the same. Remember on the previous trade our break even was 2044. On this trade our break even is going to be 2045, roughly the same, but we're only putting up 250 bucks. So the worst case scenario is we lose 250 and we have the same benefit. If the market's up here, we know it can always get better. We're losing our 250 bucks or at least something in that ballpark. If we could tr probably, you know, at any time you can sell an option. We could have sold it up here for 25 bucks or 50 bucks and just gotten part of the money back. But the thing about option trading is sometimes it only takes one day to really turn things around. Um, and trust me, it, it happens. It'll, markets will turn on a dime. So an option down here with a strike price that seems impossible and is only worth 25, 50 bucks, sometimes all of a sudden that option can be worth several hundred. You just never know. So as a put buyer, buying, this is essentially I kind of call it the equivalent of buying a lottery ticket because uh, you're only risking 250 bucks. That's the most you could ever lose. The odds of you making money may not be so great because you're buying an out of the money option. I mean, think about it. Options are priced to lose. There's no easy money. The market maker is not going to say, hey, you know, this, this option is mathematically and theoretically worth 450, but I'll give it to you for 250. That's not how it works. Options are priced to lose. So if you're spending 250 bucks on an option, chances are it's going to expire worthless. It's probably not going to pay out for you. So with that in mind, if you spend the money on it, you're generally, it's generally worth writing it to the end. Even if it expires worthless, you don't want to be the guy that sold it for 25 bucks only to watch the market collapse the next day, you know, and come back to life. So you always have a foot in the door. So hopefully all of you enjoyed uh, everything that we had, to, everything that we talked about today. Um, if you if you're interested in learning more, please check out my latest book, Higher Probability Commodity Trading. And we're actually for any, we're giving away five autographed copies randomly to anybody that registered for the class. So good luck in that. And don't forget the website's Higher Probability Commodity Trading. Sorry, higher probability commodity trading book dot com.
And we appreciate all of your support. If you have any questions at all, feel free to uh, type them down here in the question and answer box, or you can always shoot me an email or visit our website. Here's all my contact information. Okay, well, thank you, Carly. Um, we do have a question about, I'm not quite sure, the procedure of at the money option settlement on the next day of expiration. I don't know if we really want to go into that technicality here for this um, presentation. Uh, well, I'm sorry, run that by me again. Let me see if I can give a quick, easy the answer procedure to procedure of, well, he's saying on the money, he means at the money. Okay. Um, option settlement on the next day of expiration. On the next day of expiration. Okay, I'm assuming that um, we're talking about the day of expiration. The, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in regards to the E-mini S&P will automatically exercise any option that is either at the money or in the money. So uh, generally speaking, if you happen to be long an option that is right at the money, but it's basically worthless, you're nine times out of 10, just sell it for a couple bucks you can get or somehow offset it because the exchange will automatically uh, exercise it on expiration. So let me, let's clarify what that means. On the, with the weekly options, if they're expiring on Friday, they officially, they actually officially expire at uh, 3.15 Central Time. However, this is where it gets tricky. 3.15 is when the exchange decided, decides what the settlement price is, what options are in the money, and which options are out of the money, and then they exercise from there. However, a, an option buyer, someone that's long an option, has the ability to exercise the option up until the uh, four o'clock close, four o'clock central. So there's an extra 45 minutes in there of, well, actually, I take it back, it's 30 minutes because it's paused for 15. So there's 30 minutes in there where an option buyer could randomly exercise an option, um, even if it's a little out of the money. That's rare and it doesn't happen very often, but it's just something to keep aware of. Okay, and we had a question about buying uh, different deltas. Um, the question is, can you buy whatever delta you want? And of course, you can do whatever you want, but do you have any more thoughts about uh, how to decide on the delta? Um, the way I look at it is, you're, when you're looking at delta, it's just how aggressive you want to get. The higher your delta, the more aggressive you are. I mean, like I mentioned, an at the money option has a delta of 50. I probably, I'm not a big fan of buying options that are in the money, so I probably wouldn't go over a delta of, uh, of 50. But um, it's just, I honestly, I look at more at volatility and option pricing than delta to determine what I, you know, what I think might be a good buy or a bad buy. So really the, the moral of the story is keep it cheap. Make sure you're not spending a lot of premium because premium is, it's an eroding asset, and it's probably not going to pay off for you. I mean, even if you're use, if you're using it as insurance to protect your futures trade, let's face it, we all know insurance ex is expensive, and it usually it doesn't pay off. You usually end up throwing money at the insurance company, and and you never need it. So it's just a it's just that it's just an insurance policy. So you don't want to spend a lot of money. Keep it cheap. Well, you mentioned volatility. Uh, kind of a quick walkthrough on how you evaluate the volatility. Um, well, I mean, I really just look at, uh, honestly, I just look at the really, I keep things very simple. So I look at a chart and if the price, like if we're trading in a tight price range, then obviously that's a clue that volatility is low and it, and maybe that's a good time to be buying options. Um, so look at things like, uh, you know, uh, Bollinger Bands or Kelter Bands. Anything that, that shows you volatility visually is kind of how I look at it. Or you can even pull up a chart and use the historical volatility indicator at the bottom um, and just get a feel for it. But a lot of times the volatility is, is more in the option pricing itself. It's, it's in the panic of the options. So you can see um, this class wasn't about option selling, but what we look for generally, like when I pull up an option chain and I see an option that's gone from $3 to $15, those are the kind of options I look for to sell. But if I'm looking at a, a chain and I see an option that's gone from $15 to $3, then I, those are the ones I'm probably looking to buy, you know, depending on how things are. So I'm more of a keep it simple and just look at price 
and uh, try to find the panic or, or the lack of panic and, and play it by ear. Okay, and another question I think you've already answered, but would you consider selling an at-the-money call as another way to speculate if you were bearish? Sure. I mean, that's a that's one way to do it. Um, me, personally, I wouldn't sell an at-the-money option or recommend to do so unless, like, sometimes we help our, our clients do things like, um, for example, if they are, let's say, just hypothetically, they're bullish the S&P, you know, we might say to them, well, the, the call options are expensive and they're a good sell, so let's buy a futures contract and then sell a call against it. And something like that, more of a kind of an aggressive covered call strategy, I think at the money options work really well for because they're super expensive. I probably wouldn't just naked sell, recommend selling an at the money option. But the thing about this is there's no right or wrong way to do anything. It's, it's really, you know, it has to do with your personality and comfort level. So. So we had a trader who used to trade the front month options and day trade the queues. And for a smaller move, he was actually up into the 70s for the deltas. Mm -hmm. um, how is the weekly better than the monthly? Okay. Um, if you're doing something like that, like buying the in the money options on the future side of things, I think you might run into a little bit of liquidity issues. I mean, the bid ask spread gets a little bit wider, and then you're talking, um, you know, if the market moves enough in your favor, which would be awesome, of course, but if it does, then you're sometimes facing a bid ask spread of five to ten handles, which is no fun. So then you have to buy or sell futures against it, and it gets a little bit hairy. So it's not the end of the world, but just something to, to keep in mind. Um, But uh, generally, I mean, you know, again, there's not a right or wrong way. You just have to, to find your niche and, and go with it. Okay, and then one other, well, two other questions. One of them is, um, so how far out of the money is, um, um, you know, in terms of making those decisions then? Right. Um, I mean, what I would do, like, for the, in the, in the concept or context of buying weekly options, I would say you probably want to, again, keep it cheap. I probably wouldn't spend more than 300 bucks on an option, to be honest, because as we know, options erode. Um, but I would also, you know, look at your price, your futures price chart. If you're looking for, if the market's in a tight range, which it has been in the last couple of days, and you're looking for a breakout on the upside, um, you may want to try to put your strike price somewhere around the, the breakout point. So, for example, if, the, if there's resistance in the S&P at 2175, which there probably there is, I believe, you know, you may want to buy a call up there. That way, you're not paying for an at-the-money option that, uh, you know, you're paying some extra premium for an event that may or may not happen. But at least if you're buying a 2175 call, you've got a shot for something big if it does actually break out. And if not, you're you're not paying a lot of money. So I would look at support and resistance and, and price of the option and gauge it by, by that. Okay, another question was uh, your, the chart types that you like to use? Uh, chart types, I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about like time frames. Um, I know most day traders like to look at five minute bars and 10 minute bars. I personally, I scroll it all the way back to 60 minute bars. I like to see the bigger picture. Um, so I'll start with a daily chart and see where we are, uh, you know, on the overall scheme of things. And then I pull up a 60-minute chart and any, you know, that's where I think day traders are probably going to get the least amount of noise and the biggest bang for their buck. Okay. Um, the last question, we have a customer who really likes your wide screen that you've got behind you in your picture. Okay. It's curious where you found that. Right. Actually, this screen is pretty awesome. You'll notice most traders, they have like three or four monitors on their desk and it's it's all in a net which is pretty cool but um i found that i i looked into getting something like that set up and it's really complicated so i figured you know what i'm going to go this route and it's awesome you can fit like three three different applications on a single screen this is actually a dell uh, i think it's a 42 incher but i'm not sure but it's highly recommended and it is it is kind of curved so you can it's not overwhelming it's pretty cool so um dell Okay, That's great. thank you. Thank you, Carly. This uh, concludes our webinar. 
Uh, any unanswered que or questions will be given to the panelists, and she's got contact information here that you can see. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this webinar was recorded, and you'll, everyone will receive a link to the recording via email. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good evening, Carly. Thank you. Okay.